What up, what up, what up? What's happening? Kelo K. Miente. Welcome to Love, Purpose, and Passports. Hope all is well and all passport ready or passport getting ready. For those of you that don't know, I am Mr. Pro for you, living in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. This beautiful wife of mine right here, the beautiful Miss Pro. Hello. I think it's fine to rough. That's what he calls me. <laughs> My fine giraffe. He calls me a tree. This, this a tall palm Christmas tree. tree, this palm tree of mine, and <laughs> everything else tall out, out there. Meal. That's mm-hmm. meal. <laughs> so how you doing today, Miss Pro? I'm doing good, my love. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, considering the, the topic today, you know, this this wife of mine. Oh. But first, let's give a shout out. To the supporters of the channel, what up, Tite? Tite from the CPT, hit us with the seven dollar cash app. I got love, I got love for my homies who be rolling with me. Appreciate you, Tite from the CPT, Hub City, El Segundo, Rosecrans, Wilmington Central. Tite, <laughs> thank you. Were those all the same places? You know, surrounding areas. Okay. If you, if you know, you know. So today's topic, how does this wife of mine speak such good English? You know, a lot of people have been asking that question. It comes up every now and then, right? Yeah. But it's a steady every now and then where they're like, but how does she speak English so well? And I'm like, look, man, she speaks that English. Her English is better than my English. And, you know, she does that. But no, seriously, we're going to interview Miss Pro and she's going to tell us about her history of learning this English and why she knows it so well. And by the end of this interview, you'll have a better understanding and you can stop asking us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. You could ask. Oh. <laughs> so, Miss Pro, let's let's start from the beginning and, and talk about, you know, where your journey with this English began. So, Hi. Hola. And thank you for having me here. No, Mathena. <laughs> I, I, um, you know, one of my very first uh, jobs ever was working for a school, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I was, I was an English teacher for uh, for little ones, for fifth graders. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, in the DR, they start uh, in public schools. They start teaching English mandatory in the curriculum from fifth grade on, but in the private schools. If it's a bilingual private school, they teach English from preschool on. So every school has like a, a, a set of English teachers that work in the school. That's pretty common. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I used to, um, <laughs> I, I really liked that job. That was like one of my favorite jobs ever. I used to work there and one of my buddies, she was the preschool teacher. So whenever she had a break, she'd come over to my class. And whenever I had a break, I'd, I'd go over to, to her class and... It was really cute because when I would go to her class and I'd knock and I'd open the door, the little preschool babies were already learning uh, English songs. So when you would open the door, everyone would stand up and say, good morning, good morning, good morning to you. It was really cute. Uh, But sometimes when you would go visit them and it'd be 12 o'clock in the afternoon, they'd say, good morning, good morning. Then it'd be two o'clock in the afternoon. You'd open the door and they send a good morning, good morning. So it was it was cute, but I don't I don't think they were too good with time. That didn't. <laughs> it's funny because when <laughs> I, I first met her, she used to sing that song to me too. Good morning, good morning, good morning to you. Good morning, good morning, good morning to you. How are you? I'm fine, and I hope that you are too. <laughs> Hope you have a good day today, my love. Stay warm, eat, drive safely. Uh, don't get caught up in crazy New York traffic. I love you. See you tonight. Oh, I did, didn't I? <laughs> That's right. We used to talk like when she's phone. singing, I try to hold my hair straight and be all cool, but I really be like. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> right. I was singing the good morning song. I forgot. Oh, the good morning mm-hmm. song. Well, anyway. You know, teachers don't they, don't, they don't get paid very much. And this was many, many, many years ago. So we got paid even less. So my, uh, my preschool teacher friend, 
she got a part-time job and it was in a call center. I, I, I didn't know a lot about jobs or, and I didn't know too much about call centers, but she said that after school, she worked part-time and that they were hiring with the same part-time schedule. I'm like, all right, well, I don't, I don't really know too much about it, but I could try. So she told me that it was in La Zona Franca. La Zona Franca is like a free zone. A free trade a zone. A free trade zone, right. Yeah. And that was a location in uh, San Isidro where they had a bunch of buildings that all had like different uh, different call centers, right? And I went and, and I applied. And um, so now I'm working in two locations that have, uh, that have English. <laughs> so I'm basically speaking English all day, every day. So that was nice, Miss Pro. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the La Zona Franca? Is that what it was La called? And uh, oh, your experience with La Zona, La Zona Franca. Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> yeah, say it again. La Zona Franca. Woo! <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Keep it together. Okay. Eh, La Zona Franca. B back then, and this is this is many many years ago. The <clears throat> the Zona Franca was was like a, a, a isolated location. It was just one location that had like all these big call centers that was in it. Not now. Now when they saw that La Zona Franca was making so much uh, money, all that outsourcing the call centers in it, now the country has like, you know, over a hundred just spread all over the country. It's, it's, it's big money. It makes the country like 600 million a year or something crazy like that. It's, it's, it's really good. Nice. Anyway, so I went to La Zona Franca. I applied for a job and the job was for an interpreting company. And I I didn't know how to interpret. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes now I speak English and Spanish and like the cables, they get crossed <laughs> and nothing comes out right. But, you know, they, they had a really good training thing and, and I took the training for a couple of weeks. And it was really interesting because in that job, I learned more about American culture because mm -hmm. it turns out that the electric company... Uh, the American 911 mm. banks. Oh, so you were interpreting for all those uh, different companies and right. different uh, organizations. And like the company would have companies. a Spanish okay. speaker go to them and then they would call us. Mm. And then th they they just thought they were talking to an interpreter. They didn't know they were calling the Dominican Republic. Mm. So we, you know, we took a lot of 911 calls. We took calls for jails and we took <laughs> calls for like, we took like co um, court calls. Oh, this one time I messed up so bad. Oh my God. I was horrible. Like in the beginning, I got better over the years and you know, then, you know, I could, you know, but it was, I was horrible in the beginning. And so <laughs> there's one time there were these two drunk guys and they had been arrested mm. and they were like standing before, I guess a judge or something. And it was mm. late at night. Cause we had the, the evening late shift. So mm. I night think court I, probably. So you guys well, I, mean, I worked, well, I worked yeah. until like 11, 1130, like okay. that. So whatever time that was in the country, mm -hmm. in the part of the U.S. Stay, where it yeah, was it at. Yeah, it could have been anywhere. Huh, in the state. Exacto, yeah. exacto. Because we, that company serviced a lot of different like areas in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so it was two drunk guys and they had, there was two Mexicans. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know too much about Mexicans. <laughs> yeah. I think I met like my first Mexican, like, like a years ago. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, I didn't know that much about Mexicans, but I learned, I learned. And anyway, it was two Mexicans and they had been fighting. They were drunk and they were fighting on the job. I don't know if it was a warehouse or a bakery or something. I don't know, but they were fighting. And then, so the judge, and they were still clearly drunk because you could hear it in their voice how they were, you know, blah, 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 talking sl like slur, like drunk. Mm -hmm. So then um, the one, the, the the judge says to one of the guys, he says, well, sir, could you please tell me why you hit the, I guess the defendant or whoever, you know, the person yeah. he was talking to. And then he says to him, um, why well, hit him? Because, I mean, he's saying in Spanish, he's saying, I hit him because I don't like him and because he's a chupa media. And then when he said that, the word chupa media means suck, sucker. Like if you translate chupa means suck or sucker and then sock. So he was telling him that and I was like, sock sucker? What the hell is that? Right? I never heard that before in my life, but I'm interpreting. So I interpreted just as that's what I was like. So I said, you know, the, the judge says to me and I go, well, because... 
you know, I don't like him and he's a sock sucker. And the judge pauses for a minute and this is all over the phone. I'm not seeing him, but it went silent. So you could clearly tell that the judge was like, huh? <laughs> interpreter, could you please ask him why it bothered him so much that he was sucking on socks? Like, <laughs> were they his socks? Were the socks on him? Who specifically was wearing the socks that were sucked in question? So, <laughs> so I socks did, sucking going on. I mean, I didn't know what was going on, yeah, boy, but I didn't understand what the phrase meant. It was like it's a it's a Mexican. It's like no wonder they were fighting. He's been sucking on so his socks. I didn't know what was going on, so I'm interpreting the call. I was like, "Señor, exactamente, quién era que estaba chupando la media?" Sir, exactly, who was it that was sucking on his sock? You know, so I'm asking him, and I'm going back and forth. And the guy was so drunk that he never responded to any of the questions. But the judge obviously knew that I didn't know what I was doing, and he was having a good time with it. So then, you know, it went back and forth and back and forth, and eventually, the guy was drunk. He wasn't coherent. The call ended and nothing happened. The guy that was sitting next to me, because this is a call center, it's all cubicles. He was sitting next to me. He tapped me on the shoulders. He was like, stupid, sock sucker doesn't mean that. Chupa media means that the guy was like brown nosing and he was like kissing up to his boss. And I was like, oh, that's what that meant. Uh, brown nosing. <laughs> <laughs> so shortly after that, I was recommended to take a uh, yeah a Mexican idiomatic expressions <laughs> class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, after working for years of of that uh, 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 company, I learned a lot of uh, of different phrases of different expressions. I learned a lot, and then places all over the United States. So because you went through the, the process, you knew how the banking system worked. You knew how people would file for welfare. They had claims for like social security stuff. You knew things that I didn't know anything about, but because I was interpreting for those calls, it was like I was a little fly, you know, <laughs> on the wall, paying attention to everybody that was doing and just kind of translating back and forth. And it was a really, really, really dope job so i worked nice. there for a really long time yeah mm -hmm. so that helped me with with that and just the interpreting piece but then uh because all the call centers was kind of next to each other and we all you know knew each other we would go out on lunch breaks and all the call center people would like talk to each other be like how much they paying over there and what are you guys doing over here <laughs> you know and i realized that i was working less and making more money in the call center so i just stopped teaching in schools altogether Call centers made, did they make, was it a lot more or was it at that time or? So, so that's a really good question. Back then, back mm -hmm. in the day, call centers would pay you, you know, double, sometimes almost triple minimum wage oh, to okay. start. So, oh, yeah. so you that's, know, it that's was big money uh, back then. Well, yeah, because, you know, the majority of the people that worked in call centers were sometimes a little younger mm -hmm. um, and they ended up making, you know, more money than their parents uh, were making. What about, um, was this in all call centers or just the English, like if, ah, the Spanish see, call centers question. the same? No, no, no. The English speaking call centers were the mm -hmm. ones that were paying big money. Well, big money relative yeah, to, yeah. you know, what was going on. But even now, the Spanish-speaking call centers make a lot less than the English-speaking call centers. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, for the English, just English skills and the higher level English you had, mm. the more you got paid. Because mm. you could obviously go into the campaigns that required you to have a certain level of English, you know? Oh, okay. Like, for example, if you had a low level of English, well, you'd work on a campaign that you really weren't talking a whole lot. You were just talking a little bit and reading a script or something. Mm -hmm. But if you had a high level English and you work on those intense campaigns that paid the really big bonuses and stuff. Mm, nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, after working there for a while... Uh, we we uh we were talking about how in one of the call centers that was by where I was at, they had an opening for a, a trainer position. I'm like, oh, I could teach. That's what the programs are. When it comes down to the lesson plan, that's for each individual person. So we'll tell you today. Give this book, these two books. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and applied. Honestly, because I was working the the night shift and. Traveling at night is is a little little, little dangerous, yeah, so I didn't want to do that. 
Yeah, and it was pretty far away from from where I lived back then. And you know, a young lady uh, traveling at night never never the best idea. So I know my parents weren't too happy about the schedule. So mm. I applied for um, I applied for the job of a trainer. Mm. And when I went, they told me that it wasn't just a trainer; it was an accent neutralization trainer. I didn't know exactly what that was, and now that that doesn't even exist. Now mm. they call it. Um, you know, a voice, uh, something, a voice and accent trainer. They don't mm-hmm. say neutralizing it because everybody has like accents or whatever. Uh-huh. But yeah, but basically the job was to train people on how to speak in a way where Americans who were unaccustomed to listening to foreigners could understand the reason. How much would a good chuck chuck How much would a good chuck chuck How much would a good chuck 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 How much would would a wood a wood chuck chuck if a wood chuck could chuck wood? How many times? Three times. Yeah, with these numbers. Listen, I I just thought, how much wood would a wood chuck chuck if a wood chuck could chuck wood? Listen, uh, listen, uh, judges and judges assistants. <laughs> <laughs> that job, it changed my life because it had a really long training program to train us, and the professor that taught us. He was impressive. I I never seen anything like that in my life. He made me look at like the world, and language, and and sound, just different. Yeah, I remember I, you telling me about that. It, this yeah. this this man. He, I have so much like respect for him. He, he was from the Philippines, but he was raised in Europe. I don't know if it was Spain or England or something, but he was raised in Europe, and he was a linguist. And I remember that. He told us how he got into the industry because he, you know, he had like these, uh, these, these, these friends who, you know, worked or colleagues or something. And they went to the Philippines and they opened up this massive call center and they were making millions and millions of dollars. But they were spending so much money on hiring people because they had to fire people because their performance was so bad that they were just losing money. They were just hiring people to fire, hiring to fire, hiring to fire. And anybody that owns a business knows that hiring people, training them to fire them is a huge expense. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, and it's it's hard to get good people. So they realized that the problem was that the clients that they were speaking to over the phone were very unhappy with the service because they weren't really understanding what they were saying. You know, sometimes they couldn't hear well. It was It was a lot of things. So he asked him, he said, well, is there a way where you could train, you know, the people that I work with to improve in this area so we don't have like this, this gap in understanding? So he thought it was a really good challenge. And he said, all right, let me, let me see what I could do. Because remember, this man is like, you know, a linguist. And mm-hmm. I think he worked for, I don't know if it was Webster's Dictionary, you know, like that, that company oh, yeah, back then. He was, <laughs> he was the yeah. real deal. He mm-hmm. was the real deal. I was I was embarrassed to talk around him sometimes. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. But whatever. So uh then he said that so he went out to the Philippines, him and his wife, and he's from the Philippines, but he didn't he didn't live there. He wasn't raised there. When he spoke, he spoke with a British accent. It was real cool. <laughs> yeah. So he he went to the Philippines and he he I remember a story that he said where he would sit out in um in the park. And he would just listen to people passing by and he would listen to them talking, you know, talking everyday talk and conversation. And it, I guess it inspired him or something, you know, to create the the training material that we worked on. And it was real cool because he, he would say, you know, you teach people, first of all, how to produce the sound. Like he taught us how to produce every sound in the English language. I mean, like for every sound in the English language, you're supposed to move your mouth a certain way. The air comes from a certain place. The tongue does a certain thing. You know, a, a, your diaphragm is supposed to do something. You know, it, it, something is supposed to vibrate. Something is not supposed to vibrate. Like just the way he explained it to us, he taught us how to produce every sound in the English language. And it's real c- cool because sometimes I'll hear someone talking and I'm like, they didn't do this this way. They did it this way. That's why they sound that way. Oh, uh, you can tell when they're saying something the wrong way and why through yeah. the sounds and everything. And it was really cool because oh, nice. he used to have us record ourselves mm-hmm. because you think you're saying something the right way, 
But then when another person hears you, they're like, huh? and you don't realize mm-hmm. it because you think it's coming out the way you hear it. You don't, you don't know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we had to refine the way we spoke to be able to teach other people how to speak that way, you know, and, and he explained to us the way that people speak, not only their pronunciation, but just the rhythm in speech. Mm-hmm. Every, every country, every language had like a different rhythm, you know, and it was, mm-hmm. It was it was so dope. So like after I learned that, my whole life changed. The whole way I spoke, the way I spoke to people, the way I trained other people to speak. You know that that accent uh, uh, program was actually taught to people that stuttered. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was really oh, dope. Nice. It was taught to people to stutter to cure that. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> that's how I got into into speaking the way I speak. Mm-hmm. You know. I try to enunciate and pronounce certain things. It was real. It was real cool too because he he taught us like rhythm in in, in in prose. We we learned through reading poetry how to have the right. <clears throat> how, how do I how do I put it? When to pause when you speak? How to put mm. the correct stress in a sentence to mean whatever you want it to mean? So because that's completely different in like English and Spanish. So it was, it was, I'm sorry, it's completely different in English and like the Tagalog and like the, the Philippines mm-hmm. where they speak over it. Spanish is, is, is kind of the same in English. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. So that's why it's pretty easy to teach mm-hmm. uh, voice and accent training here because mm-hmm. the sounds are like the same and then the rhythm that we have is like the same. So I took that training class and that's, uh, that's where I get that from. <laughs> you no, know, English better than English speakers. You've been studying the dead English sea scrolls. That's actually pretty cool. I may, I may throw that in a joke somewhere. I like his jokes. He says jokes, and I'm like, oh, I like that one. And then like, I write it down somewhere, and then I come back and be like, Mia Mola, I used your joke, and I killed that work today. So you know what I've noticed through the years? Um, it's like I can tell that there are more people speaking English here um, of all mm-hmm. ages. And it's funny because, you know... It, so when you hear, it seems like everybody's just speaking Spanish. I mean, you can hear about them speaking English, but they don't just run around speaking English. No. So what happens is, you, like the other day, we're in the uh, the liquor store getting ready to, you know, we just bought, you know, a couple of bottles or something. But then it's I Friday. noticed some, te- yeah, I noticed some tequilas that, you know, I like. And I was just looking at the bottom. We were just speaking about it. Then the, the cashier just chimes in like, yeah, that, that one is smooth. Yeah. <laughs> Just like that, minding my business, looking at random tequilas. Because you yeah. know, my husband is a tequila connoisseur. He likes to travel. He likes to sample new stuff, and mm-hmm. you know, he likes to see what they have going on. And he's talking about it. He goes, "Man, this one looks this." And he's teaching me about tequila. And we're talking. And I'm like, "Oh yeah!" And out of nowhere, the little cashier guy was like, "Yeah, I want to smooth." <laughs> just oh. chimed in, yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. What it is is like she may. She may speak Spanish with them if it's something that I can't handle. But when they hear us going back and forth in English, they'll just chime in in different places. Like we, when we did the video um, with the go-karts the other day. Ah, uh, yeah. The, the young lady behind the counter, you'll see her. We waved at that she was the cashier. She chimed in, right? We were yeah, talking. Yeah, <laughs> she, she, was, she was telling us. She was so lovely. She was telling us about how many um how many she was in spanish she was saying how many times you get to drive around in the car and as she was speaking i was turning around mm-hmm. and i was i was interpreting and mm-hmm. i forgot how to say the turns that you go around and she goes laps it's laps <laughs> i was like you yeah. could have just said it in english you saw me struggling oh had me interpreting yeah. the whole conversation she could have just said it she was like laps ma'am it's it's laps <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, so that's the thing about here. It, it seems like for us, it'll seem like no one speaks English. No, it's not that no one speaks English. They're just not sitting around speaking English. They're speaking yeah. Spanish to each other. But a lot of times the way we find out that people speak English, they'll just hear us talking and they just chime in and say yeah. something. It is funny because it always catches me off guard. And now I don't know how to speak English or Spanish. Hey, it turns <laughs> out that the the laundry service that we use, it turns out that the owner speaks, uh, he speaks English. We speak to him in Spanish, but mm. every now and then when we are either picking up laundry or dropping something off, nice, nice couple, nice mm. family business. He'll say something to him in English and he'd be like, uh, 
Oh, I'm like, <laughs> me amor. <laughs> Look, when you go weeks it's and so weeks. It's so awkward. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it's funny because you, it's like when you get out in public, you can just go weeks and weeks without hearing anybody speak uh -huh. English. And I'm, you know, I'm just trying to absorb the Spanish and trying to get Spanish and everything. So it's like my mind is just focused on trying to get these Spanish words. What should I say? What did they just say? And then all of a sudden they interrupt that with some English. I'm not ready. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not ready. Speak Spanish. So, so there's a good reason for that, right? Remember how I told you that the call center industry, and I'm saying call center industry, but it's really called the outsourcing BPO industry, right? Mm -hmm. It's very, very lucrative. Um, I told you that I think, you know, last year alone, it, it made like 600 million or something super crazy like that. The government saw the huge potential that bringing in uh, foreign companies, foreign English speaking companies would be to the DR. So they decided to invest in teaching Dominicans how to speak English to bring in more business, to mm. bring in more uh, uh, companies to the the DR. So they expanded the Zona Francas, they expanded the free, the free trade, trade zones, zone. mm -hmm. which gave co companies the ability to come in and and, and um, start their businesses for a fraction of the cost as if they were to do it in the U.S. And they started a really cool program called the English Immersion Program. The mm -hmm. English Immersion Program is an intense one-year free program uh, and the students, you know, they can, they started like zero English. And by like the end of the year, they're like maybe a, an intermediate level. Um, are they like um, getting them ready for the call center industry? Is that what the purpose they, of that? They are. They're getting them ready for the call center industry or the hotel industry Tourism or, or basically, like yeah, or any, any industry that require that that's a foreign company that's coming into the, the DR that requires you to have that level. Of English. So you're eventually going to either deal with Americans, Canadians, or Europeans that speak English. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal, right? So, and it's working well. Uh, to date, we have like 1.1 million English speakers in the DR. 1.1 million fellas. Yeah. 1.1 million you hear speakers that? in the DR. Yeah. Just, just, just let them chime in, and you, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe have someone speaking a little Spanish, you speak a little English, and go back and forth, right. and then just listen. Right. You, you know hear that English chiming in, and like, you know, yeah, you know, and, and like I said, we we start teaching. I mean, if, if you're if you're talking to a young lady that's been educated at all, she's taken some English from the fifth grade on, mm -hmm. you know, because it's mandatory school curriculum. Right. So that's that's the nice. the norm. Don't uh, let English uh, frighten you. Yeah, when I was taking the Spanish <laughs> class at uh, Dominic, what was it? Americano, Dominic, Dominicano, Dominico, Dominicano. Dominico. Yeah, there were yeah. there were a lot of young ladies there that spoke English. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When we went to enroll him, um, even the person that was like selling the books that was behind the 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 cashier doing inventory and stuff yeah. was like speaking English. Right. So you'd be you'd they be start surprised. teaching like at all. Hey, when, I mean. What, what age does the um, immersion program start at? So the immersion program are for high school graduates that are you know going into college. I think you have to actively be enrolled or about to be enrolled in the university college to oh, go okay. to yeah to go to the English immersion program. Or is it? I don't know if the criteria is not that you have to be like eighteen years and up or something mm. like that. But the okay. majority of the people that start the immersion program have already had. A, a small foundation in English just from fifth mm. grade on. To yeah, because you were telling me some of the kids and even some of the younger yeah. kids, they start teaching English. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So with that uh, immersion program, they are, they, it just opens up their doors and possibilities. And I, I have to say, I've done, um, I've done, I've done massive job fairs, right? Like we've we've participated mm. in, in hiring. Uh, people for these these jobs you know you basically assess them and you test them and you you see if they where they can qualify for what you know their levels of language mm -hmm. experience you know where they basically fit a, a job fair right. uh, we've we've done so many it's, it's it's you know and um it's so cool how you see all these 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 young hopeful uh college mm -hmm. students and high school graduates who just finished the immersion program who are dying to work in this call center environment because they know that once they start working in an all English job or an all English company, their English is going to increase and the better English you have, what's the mm -hmm. more money and the more possibilities you, you make, mm -hmm. you know, like there's a nice. difference between being an accountant and being a bilingual accountant. <laughs> mm. There's a difference between being, mm -hmm. you know, a chef and a bilingual chef. Mm 
So like now what students want to do is, is they'll have their career goals, but they'll also take the immersion program to speak English and supplement whatever career path they want to be able to compete in an international level. Like, for example, they'll go to school for, you know, I said accounting to say accounting. Then go for hospitality or something like that. Right. Even doctors, right? Mm. You know, you, you if you want to work internationally, you're you're gonna need to be able to take testing in the right. U.S. and English. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah. so they they start preparing themselves for now to be able to to work internationally, you know. And 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 to be honest with you, not everybody wants to live abroad. They just want to live well here. Right. So those are the jobs that pay uh, really really well, just to make sure that you have that. And it's actually so cool talking about the English immersion program. Mm. So I was reading in the newspaper a couple months ago how our English uh, immersion program has been so successful that they want to mimic the same program in uh, in Colombia. Mm. I, I was seeing how a lot of the call centers that are based here are also opening up secondary locations over there, which is really cool and, and actually really intelligent because of the um, the conversion of the dollar to the, the Colombian peso. Mm. Obviously, they, everything yeah. will be like a lot cheaper for them, so they'll eventually have a higher profit margin, right? right? Oh, yeah. But it makes a lot of sense. They definitely want to take advantage of that. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's real cool. So when you were talking about the, uh, the job fairs and doing assessment, now this is the English assessment master <laughs> right here. That's so she many. Does, it's know. like second nature now. I'm like, huh? She knows the level. Yeah. <laughs> she knows. I mean, that's what she does. But it's funny because, you know, we're called the pros. So we have some of you may know that we have pro here. But we also have pro sourcing for you. Yeah. That's where the pros came from. You know, we had our different pro businesses and that's when we used to see out here. Headhunting is a thing because they need so many. um, They need it's such a high turnover in the call centers. Right. You you spoke. Yeah. The average call center employee works about uh, six to eight months. So after Mm -hmm. six to eight months, you have to replenish Mm -hmm. your headcount. Yeah. yeah. So we kind of started our headhunting business. And it's funny because I was the scout. You know, yeah. or the agent, I would. Yeah. So we had, we, we were doing it by social media. We were marketing on social media. Yeah. And so when people would respond, then, you know, I would talk, talk to them a little bit, but it wasn't, I, I wasn't talking to them verbally. I was answering him via, um, text, I mean, via, um, What's that? DM. Yeah. Uh-huh. Or DM or a private message on, on Facebook. Oh, Messenger. CCC. Yeah. Right. And right. so, <laughs> right. And so, I remember. and the thing is, it's right on my alley. They speak in English. So, you yeah. know, I would ask them a couple of questions and then we would have them. I would tell them to give me a voice note yeah. telling me a little about themselves. The preliminary screening <laughs> process. That's yeah. What it was. They would send it to me on WhatsApp mm-hmm. and I turn it over to the master right here. Yeah. Good morning. I heard that you wanted to hear my uh, voice. Uh, well, I'm just interested in the position that you uh, spoke about. And uh, this is just a good sample of my voice. I don't have any issues with pronunciation or reading or writing or editing or whichever way you want to focus on that particular language that we're speaking. It was an easy way to like pre-screen people without having to like meet them and spend money. And it really lowered our costs because mm-hmm. we would he would do the initial, you know, the Q&A where they'd ask questions about the job and whatever. We give them the description of whatever client it was that we had that wanted the to fill a, 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 a profile, a job description. And then, you know, they would tell us, well, we need them to have this level of English. We need them to be able to do this. So we go into the, you know, what the job description was and the qualifications and he do all of that. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to the actual conversation piece to determine, and then I'd have like the secondary conversation with them, depending on what we heard in the voice note. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'd just be like, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then he'd, you know, pass it over to me and be like, all right, this is a good one. You know, and then I'd call them up and I'd set up an appointment and then we'd go into the the meat of and potatoes, like they say, of the of the you know what's funny conversation. I bet you don't remember uh our first so the way we would we would advertise is we would tell them what what the uh the bonuses were that they were offering. Yeah. That they were make offering for the new companies to make uh-huh. it attractive. Yeah. But the first song we used on our ad 
Our first oh, ad. Oh, dinero fácil, 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 so many applicants for so many jobs. We mm-hmm. we did we did a lot of work there. We, we learned a we lot. Too. We did a lot of work there, you yeah. know. And and not only that, we we also. Um, I mean, you you only just see us like on uh, on social media and stuff now on mm-hmm. YouTube, but there's a lot of other stuff that we do on the on the back end. Like we do, um, we still do training and development mm-hmm. for like even after I was working as a trainer. We moved on into training and development and curriculum development and yep. instructional design. Like we create online I'm courses working, on yeah, um, yeah. on platforms. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> we do instructional design and, you know, um, we do leadership development. I mean, we do so many things. Mm-hmm. You know, we do consultations and for people that uh, want to start and create mm-hmm. uh, businesses, uh, like call centers and things of that right. nature in here. Like, we, we, we do. We'll be doing another video that goes more in depth about, like, this one was really about her. Yeah. But we'll be doing another <laughs> video to go more in depth about depth about the call centers and, yeah. you know, for people that may be interested in starting a call center business and things like that. We'll just, you know, talk about the ins and outs, you know, with dealing with call centers and everything. Yeah, yeah, because I we know you know we 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 speak to a lot of people and we see things and we know that d- d- English in the DR might have mixed reviews. You know, some mm-hmm. people are a little concerned. Well, why why does she speak English? What's where has she uh, been? Maybe she's at, maybe she's been to school. You know, she's been to fifth grade, sir. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sir. In the sixth, in the seventh, in the eighth, yeah, in the ninth, in the so, tenth, and then you know, you know she has so, to yeah. have some type of, education. Bit of, a, of, a, of a foundation there. Yeah, but I know that people don't know. You know, they think an mm-hmm. English speaking country, and the last thing that they think is that. That not only that, but just a side note, not only do they teach um, English from fifth grade on, but they also have French It's part of our curriculum. So just oh, yeah. FYI, so some of the some of the things that you probably didn't know about a different side of the of the DR. So is that about it? Do we got something else? I think, I think we do a lot, man, but I think that that's <laughs> it for now. <laughs> that's it for now. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. One more thing that we are, we need to start telling you this a little bit earlier in the video, but somehow we just start jibber jabbering. And next thing we know, it's the end of the video. But we always want you to like, like and, and subscribe. subscribe. Love, purpose, and passports.